Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about museums in the southeastern United States with guests Betsy Bradley, director of the Mississippi Museum of Art in Jackson, Angie Dotson, director of the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, and Alex Nargis, uh, director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. Uh, thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. I've been so excited about this discussion. Uh, I wanna thank you all for, for joining us today. And, and let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing. Uh, so uh, your museums tell stories through arts uh, as, uh, and, and at this time of pandemic, confront conf confrontations over race identity, debates over cancel culture and cultural appropriation, we have hurricanes, um, an economic crisis, fires of biblical proportion. Uh, are you telling stories today that divert uh, or that go to the heart of these matters? Or are you taking some other approach? So Betsy, let's, let's start with you and then we'll go around this virtual room uh, to Angie and then to Alex. Betsy, could you, could you take on that? How, what kind of stories are you telling nowadays? Well, we're trying, to, we're trying to do all of the above, I guess, um, in some ways. We have um, a really wonderful uh, traveling exhibition up that actually comes from Alex's museum. So we have the Mellon collection of French paintings and sculpture um, called Van Gogh, Degas, and Monet and their times. Um, it's really been wonderful to see people come in and find this kind of refuge, um, just being washed over with sheer beauty. You know, I've seen tears coming down people's faces. We've had lots of um, comments of gratitude that there is a place that, that drowns out the noise um, with real simple, brilliant beauty. And then our permanent collection galleries has an exhibition um, where we try to really probe some important questions about Mississippi and Mississippi's narrative as central to the American story, um, where we um, are exploring stories of migration, ancestry, memory, uh, just fights for justice, our fraught relationship with the land and our shared humanity. These are all explored through uh, a poem written by Margaret Walker, an African-American poet who taught here in Jackson for 40 years and um, wrote songs of my people and um, other really important works that asked these kinds of questions about race and equity. And so we're trying to get at that too, at the same time that we're trying to offer um, this wonderful experience through the art that the Virginia Museum lent us. The thing that I love about that explanation is if you take a look at, at uh, popular culture, touch points like uh, Trevor Noah, what Beyonce is doing, or, or some other of, the, uh, of these amazing leaders, right? You have um, uh, humor, Dolly Parton. You have humor, you have uh, popular entertainment, you have, uh, we don't have to all be focused on the intensity of intenseness all the time, uh, right. but we also cannot duck issues, right? We have to really be, uh, take an extra effort to go to places that are uncomfortable and to confront questions uh, that, that are contemporary questions that are part of the American tapestry. Angie, how are you approaching this very complicated time where people are under stress, they need some relief, but they also are, are interested in exploring uh, the ideas that Betsy were, uh, was raising? Right, well, I'll start by saying that our current situation is that we have had our sculpture garden reopen for the past, uh, going on two weeks now. Our galleries are not yet open. So the experience that we're able to offer visitors is sculpture garden, only the galleries that you pass, pass through to go to the restroom inside of the building and then our online op offerings. And just like Betsy, we've entered into a, you know, not an either or, but an and proposition for our audiences where, um, you know, the story that I think 
the setting of our garden has to tell as well as the art that fills it is one of um, peace and calm and resilience and recreation and restoration and all of that that people so crave right now. Um, inside the galleries, we, for the longest time, back when we thought that we were going to be reopening in May, uh, went on and installed a gorgeous and powerful exhibition, um, happened to be of African American printmakers from um, the Paulson Fontaine Press, which I think Mark is up near you. And it was a heartbreak. The heartbreak of the pandemic has been that we never, you know, I think 10 people other than staff got to see that exhibition. It hit head on the very issues that are in our hearts and in our news every single day. So to not have that as a physical platform for um, you know, the, the and, the other side of the and equation to give people a space and a place and um, some content to really do the work of the moment was um, a killer. You know, even though we took all of that to our virtual programming, you know, as we all know, it's just different to be with the art. We can do our damnedest to, to create you know, an analog experience online, but to not have folks in those galleries is, um, it's just not what we are about. We've now installed an exhibition of uh, the beadwork of the women who lived in the Ubukle community in South Africa. So we've got another place where people can do um, some of the work of reconciliation and I, you know, I'm working right now with our city to figure out when it's going to be right for us to share that, that exhibition, that art with folks. So we are, you know, as everybody is just pressing in as many directions as we can at once. That's what museums do. We're always pushing in multiple directions, trying to create that, that entry point for as broad an audience as we can. And the idea of truth and reconciliation is really important uh, today, um, given what is going on in Kenosha now, uh, uh, just recently, um, just a heartbreaking circumstance. Alex, you, you run uh, one of the largest uh, museums in one of the great cities of the South. Uh, could you talk about how you're approaching these various issues, pandemic, race, flooding, <laughs> fires. How, how, are you, how are you functioning? Well, we've been, we've been on this uh, path for a long time. Uh, you know, part of our strategic planning when we go back to the opening of our new wing 10 years ago uh, was really about enhancing the programming, enhancing the collections uh, so that we really, really reflect Virginia. Uh, but we're, you know, we're a global institution in the sense that right now, uh, the two major special exhibitions we have on view, one is uh, ancient art from the, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo uh, called Sunken Cities, these two cities that sunk into the Mediterranean a couple thousand years ago uh, and were locked under a, a bed of silt, and just a huge and fantastic exhibition. Of course, uh, closed for the first six weeks while we were closed for our three and a half months. We're the only art museum in America that is, offers free general admission and is open 365 days a year. And sometimes people challenge me. It's like, well, yeah, what about Thanksgiving and New Year's? And <laughs> it's Christmas Day. It's like, well, no, we're open every day. We're open. In fact, we have the best hours of any art museum in the country. We're open um, three nights a week. Uh, and as I say, we're free. We do charge for special exhibitions, but then our, our membership gets in free. We make our pricing for membership enormously attractive. It's actually cheaper to join for a family uh, than it is to buy tickets to a show. Uh, and the idea there is that, you know, we want you to be part of who we are uh, because we not only serve Richmond, but we serve the entire state. Uh, we have uh, uh, distance learning. Uh, so we're in, in every rural area, every school across Virginia. Uh, we have exhibitions and programs, speakers, teacher workshops that we conduct all across the state. And then we have a state-of-the-art art mobile. It is the most magnificent uh, moving uh, museum you've ever seen. Uh, it is a 53 foot uh, box, climate controlled and security. And uh, it's actually a large 
uh, truck that becomes a double wide. Uh, and down south, double wide means something of luxury. And uh, it, it, it rolls into town and we'll get thousands of people in these small places that are, you know, a couple hours away from any art museum or any art experience. Uh, and when we roll into town, it's it, even today in 2020, it is the biggest thing that's happened. So our goal, though, is to, to serve everybody. The other special exhibition we have right now um, is an exhibition that was curated by one of our contemporary art curators on uh, Louis Draper, who was a Richmonder, a photographer, uh, who went to Virginia State University, uh, came back to Richmond in 57, could not get a job because he was black, went to New York, and then a few years later founded this group called the Camoinde, and they're still active today. And we focused on the first decade of the Camoinde starting in 63, and so we have a massive show, about 170 photographs uh, in our other special exhibition space that will travel to the Whitney, uh, will go to the Getty, and also to uh, Cincinnati. Uh, and, and, you know, our goal is to always be able to put these shows and catalogs out on the road. But when we look at, particularly with the, the issues of social unrest, the first Africans came to English North America as enslaved people to Virginia in 1619. So the first 250 years of enslavement uh, happened right in our front yard, uh, and, and we were the perpetrators. Uh, and then the next 150 years haven't been that much better, although slavery has been eliminated. So when we look at who we are, our collection, our staff, our boards, our audience, uh, we want to make sure that we reflect us and us being everybody. And that's why going back to being open 365 days a year, uh, our definition, and then we had a consultant when I first arrived about 14 years ago who said, you got to focus narrow and deep. And we said, no. And he said, who's your audience? And I said, everybody. And, it, and then that's what we all need to do uh, because it isn't just about the art tourist. It is really about everybody. We just uh, completed a poll in which uh, the respondents said 65% um, of, of people said that they come to museums to uh, see art and then uh, almost 30% uh, said uh, to learn about different points of view. And that everybody uh, piece is really important because if everybody is included, then you get to, to uh, experience not only everybody experiencing, but also different, different points of view. But who gets to tell the story? I mean, it, it, it can't escape notice that we have uh, four white folks uh, here uh, who are talking about um, diversity and talking about stories and talking about art. Um, as you go out and try to, um, to engage um, all sorts of diverse audiences, Alex, and, and you're trying to shape your staff to so that you can tell the stories from different points of view and your board so that you have representation. How do you confront this, this imbalance that still exists across museums? Well, the imbalance is there certainly at the director's level, but it's not just uh, people of color, it's also men versus women. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, although I will tell you from a, from a genetic standpoint, I'm actually 20% Asian, so I'm, I'm only a minority minority, but you look at my senior management team, and uh, half of all of my senior management team are people of color. Uh, the four, four of eight people, three of whom are African-American women. And mind you, that didn't happen by happenstance. What we did was enlarge our pool uh, of candidates, the best people we could find, and then hired the best people from that pool. Now, it just happened to be that we were fortunate enough that uh, we were able to have a senior management team that reflects who we are. But then you look at then our managers and department heads, and we've got about 40% uh, of our 40 or so departments across the museum, uh, actually more than 40% are African American department heads. And again, that is, that's not by happenstance. Uh, and we have to change. You go to some museums in this country, in fact, I'd have to say maybe many museums, uh, and it is all white. Uh, certainly, in many cases, because the museum I inherited uh, 14 years ago uh, was mostly men. Uh, and, you know, that, that happens because people are lazy, they're not focused, uh, and they need to think about how, to your question, how do we engage and how do we relate? And the one question that, that rings true in my mind, and I've heard it for years, for the last 40 years, is 
why don't I see more people that look like me? And I don't care whether somebody's Indian Asian or Native American, uh, African American, but that question resonates for everybody. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the whole issue now, because since we are storytelling institutions, that storytelling comes out of lived experience, right? And that lived experience needs to be acquired over a lifetime. It's not just an educational pedigree. It's the ability to look at art, to experience art, and to connect with audiences, because if you don't connect with audiences, you just don't have a purpose. You're just a building. You're just a building that houses stuff. Angie, how do you approach this very complicated and thorny issue? Well, here I'll say that this is my first directorship and I have been here for just under two years. So we hit the one year mark where after a year of observation and study and thinking and sorting, you know, I was ready to hit go and make some of the bolder moves um, for us, and, and as Alex points out, I, I don't do it, we all do it as this group. This is the face that represents this whole community of influencers and deciders, and you know, then pandemic happens. So it's, it's been interesting to continue to um, stretch and change and grow against some of the compounded challenges that we're facing. Um, I know I've had that conversation. People have to get a mind, their mind around, people have to get their mind around change, right? And in particular, when the pandemic is hitting, right, it, everybody freezes on all sides because we're taking care of our families, right? So you have this sort of planning thing. You then get to the point where you're ready to act. The pandemic hits. Action is still required. In fact, it's begged by other circumstances uh, that are occurring. Um, and the pressure is just on, isn't it? Well, the pressure is on, but the opportunities are emerging all at the same time. So, you know, yeah, this is a challenge for everybody, but the, you know, it's also a make or break moment where it's so interesting to see who, who folks are able to show up as. And some people, you know, are paralyzed in moments like this and others are just able to capitalize on on demands like the ones we're facing them and, and use them to take things that you have wanted to do for your institution and realize that a want has become a need. It's become necessary and to really um, operate from that place. So, you know, I am a huge optimist. I, my parents just raised me to be the person that looks for the good in the bad. And that is, you know, how, how we're trying to make our way through. And I'm very lucky to have this um, crew of folks here who also work from that mindset or from that value, whatever it is. I will say though, going back to the point of, you know, I was so envious to hear Alex's description of the team that he's built over, over time, because, you know, truth be told, we are, um, you know, diverse when you get into the, the nuts and bolts of us, but at first glance, it is a bunch of white people making the decisions for this institution, be that at the senior management level, the middle management level, or those magical individual contributors whose, whose influence is just as important as the folks who are operating at the technical top. Um, you know, we are so, you know, like Alex, we are, we're not only coming into this conversation because of what's happening this year. You know, my first chore here was to take a lot of thinking and, and smush it into a strategic plan. And, you know, a lot of these values that, again, the stuff that has gone from a, we want to be this to a, now we, we absolutely need to be this, this, this 21st century museum that is filled with people who do represent these lived experiences because you know, only you know, truth and interpretation can only come from that, right. that space. But you know, I'm sitting on this side of it. I'm just lucky to be doing it at an institution 
that, for example, has received art from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation in the past year. And, you know, I love that they're taking the proceeds from the sale of that art and putting it into um, paid internship funding um, where they're trying to place emerging museum professionals of color into institutions that have received art from the Arnett collection. And that's, that's, um, really, that's really how, how change happens, right? You, you engage others. Yeah. And Betsy, you just wrote an article um, that has uh, really gone through some of these issues. Um, and could you just describe a little bit, uh, unpack your article, unpack the perspectives that you've developed? <laughs> Alex hired me to be the education director at this museum 20, <clears throat> a few years ago. <laughs> and, and, um, and I have been here at this museum as director for almost 20 years. So this is, this is work that has been um, percolating and building momentum for a very, very long time. Because we are in Mississippi and we are the place where our country's foundational economic system and story of race relations and all that was played out. And um, we have a lot of reckoning to do. I also think that the museum industry has a lot of reckoning to do. And I think that what my article tried to get at was until we as leaders um, do the personal work that we need to do and ask the questions about our privilege and, and our whiteness. Um, we, we're asking the wrong questions. I, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about how many people are on your diversity committee or, you know, these kind of tactics when I think we have to investigate the essence of what a museum is and how we can prioritize what we all care so much about, which is the magic that happens between art and people when they get together and the transformational experiences that can happen. What are the most just and equitable structures we can create to make that experience happen? And I, I mean, I, I'm agreeing with everything y'all are saying I had a vacancy as chief curator for a long time until I could find an African-American chief curator because I knew that that voice had to be the one guiding our artistic program. Um, and so it's also important not just to have a diversity of staff and a diverse board, but to have people in positions, as Alex said, in leadership positions and, and have people that will challenge you that will call you up when you hit a blind spot or you realize that you have no idea what that experience of someone of color is like. Um, and so, yes, we talk about a lot about lived experience and elevating that as a voice to be just as important as the curatorial voice. And so we talk about shared authority, we talk about the community voice, and yet, there are times, like everyone, as you mentioned, Mark, when, when stress hits, that we revert to traditional museum processes and curatorial practice and collections priorities. And it's the role of leaders to do, you know, something I had to do recently, which is say, stop, that's your comfort zone, but change doesn't happen by staying in your comfort zone. We've got to push through that. Um, so I think it's, a, it's really about the essence of what a museum is and, and realizing what's most important, um, building structures that create equity, liberty even, um, especially um, you know, when it comes to the issues of race for us in the Southeast. Um, and, and having leaders that will push people through the challenging moments when our defaults go back to form instead of work, the work we're doing. One of the things that is so fascinating here is that you are all selecting the successors who will run the museums of the future, right? You are 
yeah. saying to yourself, and this is an adherence to the golden rule. You are trying to treat others as you would wish to be treated. Yeah. You are trying to uh, look at the sector and say, how does the sector remain healthy? Right? You're making these strategic decisions. It's not lost on me that in, in engaging with you, Betsy, he engaged with you as an educator. Angie, you also have an educational background, right? The educational piece, the issue of how do you convey knowledge and how do you um, create experiences of art using objects in the museum platform, that piece allows you to finesse some of the pedigree issues, right, Alex, that mm -hmm. we have in the museum field that excludes different voices, right? We s established a few years ago this the Center for Art and Public Exchange, which operates inside our facility, inside our organization as uh, what our curator calls um, a shower head that dribbles over everything we do. And it is solely dedicated to um, the issues of race and equity and to examining artwork and bringing artists and community together through that lens. And so what you're talking about is really important, Mark, because the experience inside the gallery, when you have um, a few people standing in front of an artwork, having conversations about that artwork um, that result in thinking about our relationships with people of different races and how we view different experiences, that's the real power, because if you just talk about diversity, if you just talk about inclusion and equity as abstract concepts, um, real change is not going to happen. It's the, it's the artist's vision and the artist's voice who, who kind of compel us to relate to an experience different from our own and to people different from our own that enables internal change to really happen. You know, kind of approaching that from another direction um, that speaks to, you know, me as an educator leader um, or as a, a female leader, the thing that I love about being a woman or coming from education, and this is not exclusive to us, but I think these are characteristics of what we bring to the work of leadership is, um, you know, it is natural to us to work from soft skills. So, you know, what Betsy says about doing self-examination and having the courage to break it all down to the point of, you know, the golden rule or it being about love and just transcending politics and faith and everything is, is I think the strength that we are able to bring to the conversation, you know, outside of my door I've got this little Cornell West quote, and I, I hope I don't butcher it here, but you know, for me, it's, it's the essence of what we are trying to do. And it's a line that says, you know, justice is what love looks like in public. And you know, the word art is not in there, but I have to say that you know, I don't not see that as I go in and out of my office door every day. And for me, that is that um, the power of self-examination and making sure that you're working for that place of personal truth. Well, it's a reminder, right? It's, it's a meditation, isn't it, Alex, on, on values. We just uh, finished a couple of polls. One was, uh, will you give to museums, even in this time of pandemic, where needs, other needs uh, really dominate? Um, and in particular, because museums are under threat and one in eight uh, may uh, close uh, due to the pandemic. And 84% of respondents said that they would definitely um, give. Um, and then um, in terms of attending, um, 80, um, uh, actually 96% uh, of people said that they would attend museums, uh, definitely 17% regardless. And if strong safety protocols are in place uh, for a visit, 78%. So the, the, uh, among these attendees today, there's a huge appetite. Alex, uh, could you uh, see us out, because we're, we're ending our time today, but could you see us out with this, uh, with your view of how the sector um, must develop and will develop over the next years, and how museum leaders 
um, can evolve the museum model to ensure that we have audiences, that we are telling stories from different perspectives that are engaging. How do you triangulate all of this so that we are creating institutions that follow in your footsteps over in Richmond? Well, actually, I have to say it's relatively simple. Um, have a plan, uh, but make it foundational. Make, make sure that, and whether you're talking about the collection, your boards, the staff, your programs, your exhibitions, everything you do, everything you are, everything you look like and, and experience uh, is reflective of the things that are important that we've all just been talking about. You know, accessibility is absolutely best. For, forget the committees and forget all of the things that spend time and, and, and look good from the outside. Uh, and, and I think, you know, what Betsy said, and you all have to read that, that uh, wonderful uh, article, uh, is, you know, stop talking about it. Stop uh, making yourselves look good and stop issuing statements. What we need to do um, is make change foundational, make sure that we reflect who we are as a people. And that means people from all parts of the world, uh, people of, of every ethnicity and, and across time. And those are the things that will make the difference. And if we do that, and if we're earnest about it, uh, and not take no for an answer, because we don't allow no in our shop at all, uh, then, then we'll all be successful. But I will say, and to Angie's uh, point, and Angie, uh, I've been at this for 40 years, so I, I you know, measuring it with that yardstick instead of two years, uh, feel good about what you are doing because it does take time and you can't perform miracles, nor do they, nor do they work, nor will they look sincere or honest. And working with the, everybody to create the future is the only way it's gonna happen. Alex, it's just such a, such a great statement. You know, America is a country that constantly evolves, that constantly embraces the future, that constantly changes. And your work at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, Betsy, yours at the Mississippi uh, Museum of Art in Jackson, and uh, at the Montgomery Museum of Art, Angie, you all are really leading the way. And it just goes to show that leadership in this field, in the arts field, in the museum field, uh, uh, can come from your institutions in the Southeast. You, your models are instructive to us all. Thank you all for participating. Um, attendees in particular, thank you for your attention. Uh, please continue to spread the word and everyone stay safe. That's the nonprofit report. <laughs>